All right, so sacred stewardship, we're continuing to talk about these essential truths that have been passed down through the church for generations. And tonight, last week, we talked about God the Father. Tonight, we're shifting to talk about, or we're taking the next step with the Trinity, talking about the God the Son. So the uh, long title to this, Entrusted to Know, Follow, and Proclaim our Savior, Lord, God, the Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, um, yeah, this one's a little long, so we'll see if we can finish everything in one, one sitting. No, I'm going to keep an eye on the time. But no, no, please talk. Yeah, don't stop from that. So last week we talked about, kind of introduced with just looking at theological method. And just want to... Uh, Mention this real quick because with with Christ, these three things are essential uh, to be faithful to what the scriptures say about him, about God, the son, to be consistent in our Christology. And we'll, we're going to get into Christology tonight, looking at false teachings or off the off the ramp teachings and then historically authentic um, and we'll see a little bit of how the church um, worked against or, or dealt with some of the false teachings and how that caused them to even go and write, um, either adjust the creeds or write even a new confession specifically focused on the son and who he is. Um, so what is challenging about Jesus? about thinking about him. Fully God and fully man at the same time. Right. A toddler who holds the world together. Terrifying. <laughs> he is at his it. What's that? <laughs> and the self control that he didn't he, the sinless self control that he didn't take advantage of that. And, it's and beautiful. It explains how people, because of our finite minds, came up with an idea that, that he didn't become God until after his baptism and the Holy Spirit is saying, you can almost understand how he came up with those kinds yeah. of uh, heresies. Uh, but he had to have been born. You know, that, uh, he made the eternal, even though he wasn't incarnate. Yeah. If I use the right words there. Mm hmm Yep. Yep. Pre-incarnation, he's eternal son of God. Um, we're going to dig into, try and dig into this tonight. Um, and uh, so we talked last week about this essential truth. God the Father, we believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. And now we're going to God the Son. And what would you think is important in a confession about God the Son? What's important... What's essential to say about him? His death, resurrection, and ascension. Yeah. Yeah. He's the son of him. Fully God and fully man, right? That he wasn't created. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, so... So this past Easter, there was a fascinating article that came out in the Wall Street Journal. And the Wall Street Journal, um, I've noticed, um, regularly does articles on faith and on Christianity. The big headline in, in large newspapers like the Wall Street Journal is the declining attendance in the church, sliding membership in the church. But this one came out right at Easter, and it was, it's titled, Our Many Jesuses. Here's the picture that they used. And it was stimulated, this article was stimulated by a campaign that I think has kind of died out. But it was big because during the Super Bowl, they showed two ads for it. The, uh, um, the He Gets Us was the campaign. Um, he gets us. Yeah. And so uh, 
it describes, this article begins by describing um, the, uh, uh, the nature of those advertisements. And then it goes to, into, ex from there going, okay, what are people, what do different people really think about Jesus? There's many Jesuses is the, the title. So here's one thing that, um, there's, this is a professor of New Testament and Jewish studies at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Um, and what uh, she says, Amy Gillivine, uh, and they kind of intro this, um, this statement that she makes by saying, variety in portrayals of Jesus is practically as old as Christianity itself, starting with the four accounts of his life presented in the Bible, the Gospels. And here's what she says. The different Gospels give you different versions of Jesus. We put them together for ourselves because no one's Jesus is going to be like someone else's Jesus. I mean, that's out in the culture. Now, now let me get that's a right. professor they go to teaching. A Jewish professor to ask about Jesus Christ. New Testament and Jewish studies. That's what she's teaching. So she is teaching New Testament. But is she a believer? Well, I would, I would, from this statement, I would question that. Because if you look at the Gospels and say there's four different versions of Jesus in the, in the Gospels, I would question um, whether or not she truly... I yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. there are some mentions of evangelicalism and, and, and Christianity, but they're not really uh, they're not really good pictures of, of evangelical and Christianity. The only uh, the only valuable thing in the article was they interviewed Ar Albert Moeller, and uh, um, Albert Moeller actually gave a little snippet of the gospel in his description. So that was, you know, the, uh, I was surprised that the article had that in it, but it did. Anyway, what this suggests is that uh, it's okay to have your own understanding of who Jesus is. That's okay to do because uh, that's what our culture has. That's what the world has. That's what they discern that this advertisement was suggesting um, he gets us. Here, yeah. Don't know. I mean, the, the last name suggests maybe it is, but yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. 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 The uh, the reason I. The reason I brought this article to our attention is thinking about um, having a clear understanding of who Jesus is, a clear ability to have a conversation with somebody um, who maybe has never really thought about him seriously and would react like, oh, well, he's like this, or, oh, yeah, I've heard of him, he's like this. Um, but since there's, since there's academic views, and cultural views uh, that don't talk about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, biblically, um, and it's important for us to be able to to have a good understanding of what the Bible says, what it's re revealed to us about Him, a good understanding of it, to be able to have a conversation with somebody who's um, one of the one of the uh, individuals that interviewed said, we're in the kind of society that's very pluralistic and it's natural that this is going to happen in our culture. Um, and so I think ours has to be clear. It's an essential truth and we need to be clear about understanding who he is and be teaching it, right? Um, the, uh, what's his name? The guy that was on stage a few weeks ago, the couple that were up there, but he popped in and he said, yeah, I was, I've been, I'm, 
I, we were teaching the Trinity to third graders, or no, no to, you know, was it, yeah, third graders in, in class last week. And they were asking questions about, well, does that mean there's three gods? So and they were, they were teaching the Trinity to these, and I said, this, that's awesome. Um, so here's our confession. Here's a summary. We're going to look at the we'll look at this in more detail later. But here's the essential. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. So this is the uh, Nicene Constantinople and Creed, the beginning of it developed in the fourth century, late fourth century, 381s when that was written, and it was developed after and during a lot of controversy over the divinity of Christ. So that was happening to the church for now three centuries. Um, and we're gonna see some of those, those conflicting teachings and so they, they determined, okay, we need to have a statement that is biblically true and puts boundaries around all these false teachings that have, that have cropped up. And here was the beginning of it. So down to us, right, this confession, down to us. And now we've got to think about how do we steward this confession well? How do we steward our confession about the incarnate Son? We already know there's mystery in, the, in understanding the Trinity. We can confess it, can't truly understand it, but we can confess the truth about it and believe it. And now we come to the Son, who's not only fully God with Father and Spirit, but now incarnate, He has two natures, truly God and truly man. So uh, the same process that we use, um, as with, with uh, other essential doctrines. What does the Bible say about, about this? Uh, how do we rightly interpret it? Because when the false teachings began, a lot of them were using the scriptures and interpreting them differently to come up with their conclusions and their arguments and their positions. Um, some were tearing apart the scriptures and saying, well, this doesn't belong in there, this doesn't belong in there, this doesn't belong in there. So how's, how's the, what is, what is, what's disclosed in Scripture? Uh, and then faithful and careful expression, just like you saw with, with uh, the, the statement from the, from the Creed of 381. That was a carefully written expression which was guarding the truth from Scripture against false teachings. And then why is it important? How do we apply it? Well, one reason is important because... We've got a very confused world when it comes to talking about Jesus. Greek. So when did it get translated to English and how did they pick the words for that? Because I mean, begotten is not a common word. <laughs> it's very common back in the 1400s. Yeah. But, but when would that have been translated? Um, that's a good question. I don't know, honestly, when it got. Translate. It's been translated many times, though. There's, there's been, yeah, there's been, um, just like there's, um, just like there's different translations of scripture that you'll see. So if you lay some Bible side by side, you'll see the wording. Um, they're all carefully trying to translate the Greek. So when this is translated, it was, it was careful use of careful study of the Greek to do that, right? Um, but if you go and look up the Nicene Constantinople Creed, you'll find it'll say the same thing, but you'll find some different word translations. I think I've actually got the book. Sorry. So this no, one is so the Nicene Creed. What was the other one you mentioned a while ago? 1970 is when I wrote it was translated. Really? By who was that? Pretty sure it got translated in English it then. earlier than that, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, that's, a, that's a good study exercise that somebody can do and bring it back to the class next week. Uh, do a little his, history of the translation of the... the Apostles' Creed in English yeah. in the 60s in yeah. church. So. 
Okay, so uh, scripture, let's go to scripture. And um, I've come up with six different uh, places to go in scripture to get the disclosure of the, of the, um, of the son and the incarnation. Uh, one is there's some narrative indicators of the incarnate son in the Old Testament. So these are outside the prophets and outside of some of the Psalms, but just narrative indicators. Can you think of a couple of places in scripture in, in the narrative where there's indicators of the son? Yeah. Of the coming of the son? Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Yeah. Uh, what's, and what's Genesis 3 about? Yeah, yep. That's one that's used as a pointer to, to the coming of the Son. Yeah. Um, prophecy of the Incarnate Son by the Old Testament prophets. A lot of those. I've only given you a few in the handout that I've given you. Um, Isaiah 7. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Guess what? That scripture is used in Matthew's gospel when he gives the account of, uh, of uh, the angel coming to, to Mary. And then he says, this is because, this is because, and he cites this verse. Um, you've got uh, Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, while I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he is called the Lord, our righteousness. Micah 5. Uh, but as for you, Bethlehem, Epathra, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel, his going forth are from long ago, from days of eternity. So there's a good little you know, teaser of who he will be. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. So Micah. Um, and then proclaiming of and pointing to the incarnate son by... The forerunner, John the Baptist. John the Baptist says some amazing things about, um, about Christ. Um, here he is in, John in John's Gospel, chapter 1. Here's tw verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of the God who takes away the sin of the world. Now he does, just doesn't say that. He says, this is he on, whom, on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Okay, so Jesus born humanly after John, right? I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize him in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So prior to Jesus' ministry, um, you know, prior to him uh, doing miracles and saying things to say who he is. Here's John the Baptist declaring him to be the Son of God. Then John 3.25. So uh, there arose a discussion on part of John's disciples, John the Baptist, with a Jew about purif purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you've testified. Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him, talking about Jesus. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, 
but I've been sent ahead of him. And then in verse 31, he says this, he who comes from, from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks to the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about Jesus. What he has seen and heard of, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now listen. Remember how he said this uh, following Jesus' baptism. Here he is again. The Father loves the Son and has given him all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the forerunner, even as his ministry is declining and he's gonna be imprisoned and killed, is proclaiming Christ to be God the Son the Son of God. So, keep going and, and look at what Jesus um, did and said himself, declaration and demonstration by the incarnate Son. I've encouraged the reading of, of John's Gospel. So there's, um, there's notably in there seven different miracles that indicate his deity, seven different sayings where he says the I am the I am of, of uh, God speaking to Moses. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am. Seven different sayings where he's using that, that terminology specifically. And those that are careful hearers, um, and some of the careful ones get angry at him for, for doing that. You know, one of the things that struck me when I, I've been reading through John this, this the Gospel of John this week, with this in mind, is, yeah. I see it right here too, though. Uh, verse 31 down here, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. That yeah. temple must have been one rocky place. Because every time you turn around, they're in the temple, <laughs> they're in the, you know, and they're picking up stones. What are the stones doing there in the first place? You know, you don't sweep the place every now and then. I mean, it's just a, I'm sorry. It just struck me as kind of odd that every time you turn around, they want to stone him, and they yeah. pick him up right there. You know, it's just. Well, you know, you're still able to stone people by Jewish law, I believe, in that time. So maybe at the, you know, at the temple where the, you know, the money changers and all the marketeers were, maybe they had, you no, know, a stone lie. booth <laughs> where they. The, the I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> <laughs> So the passage you came to, though, this is a fascinating one because this is a um, this is where they ask him directly if he's the Christ. So, verse twenty four in John ten, Jesus and gathered around him are saying to him, "How long will you keep us in suspense? If you were the Christ, tell us plainly." Now he's been demonstrating and saying that. Um, Jesus answered them, "I told you, and you do not believe the works I do in my Father's name. The works that I do in my Father's name, they testify of me." And he's been doing that throughout his ministry. He's been declaring things that indicate specifically who he is, and he's demonstrating it through those, those, those works. My sheep hear my voice. Uh, you, I, you do not believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They know them, they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. So there's a statement, right? I give eternal life to them. There's a definite statement should be answering their question. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. Again, he's saying it directly. No one's able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, made yourself out to be God. So isn't that fascinating? They ask him, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? But what causes blasphemy is to declare himself, declare himself to be fully, fully, fully and truly God, Son of the Father. Um, and then he, he goes on later to say, you are blaspheming because it's, and I'm the Son of God. If I do not do the works of the Father, don't believe me. But if I do them, so he's going back to their statement about, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not condemning you for the works you've done. 
but he's, now he's going to go back and use that to say, that demonstrates who I am. If I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I in the Father. So he escapes from that. Um, um, you can read these other ones in here. Uh, John 12, another good one. John 13. So in both of those, he's, he's talking about the glory of the Father and the glory that he's demonstrating for the Father and how he's going to be glorified as well. So the incarnate Son, over and over through the Gospels, over and over through the Gospels, um, you see Jesus disclosing himself. Just like in John 1, he's going to reveal, he's, he, by his incarnation, reveals the Father. Over and over in the Gospels, you see him um, doing things and saying things. It should clearly let people know, especially if they're familiar with the prophecies in the Old Testament and all the other indicators in the Old Testament, and they're the studied guys, they should know it. Yeah. What is your view on like, Old Testament Christophany? Uh, I don't have a clear... That's what I've been thinking about a lot. Um, Old Testament Christophanies, Christophanies, where someone appears and it's some think that that's an appearance of of the sun. Sun's doing that Christoph. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think Hebrews clarifies that question um, pretty well because he's in the order of Melchizedek. Not, not the Melchizedek, yeah. Um, um, the, the incarnation happened once. <laughs> so that's what I struggle with when I look and try and point to Old Testament and say, well, that's an appearance of the sun. Um, because if he's fully man. But those aren't, I mean, I mean those are, yeah. God, so he could. Yeah. But... Uh, the, the the uniqueness of the uniqueness of the incarnation is what gives me hesitation to declare that he's appeared somewhere else um, because the the plan of God is for this for this to be the time so even though he wouldn't have looked like he did anyway I'm, yeah so I, I yeah. Presence, I, I, but, and then he says, You can't look upon the face of God without being destroyed completely. Yeah. So, how yeah. do they walk with sin? Yeah, because they're, they're still pure and, and sinless. But after you know? sin, he made them the loin cloths and stuff. So, out of animals, yeah, much better than the Yeah, yeah, you know, but we don't get, get a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of supposition that goes into. into Discerning that, though, I think. You're saying it's not one of the fundamental points. Um, it's it's worthy of it's it is worthy of thinking about um, God's disclosure of Himself throughout the whole Bible. Um, but there are places you can spend a lot of time on that may not be real necessary. So, yeah, and I I, I got to be careful saying that because people that have studied those things carefully, they're doing it purposefully. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I just... Yeah, I think he's a good... He's God. He can appear any time he wants to, any time he wants to. And I kind of wasn't yeah. really that the incarnation was like, you know, well, the big deal. And it was in the sense that it was his fullest revelation of himself. Yeah. Even, yeah. Yeah. Well, Stephen, Paul. Um, even if that were, even if he did uh, appear, there were Christophanies in the Old Testament. Even if he did, that that did not reveal anything about him that people would have projected into. A future incarnation. So, yeah, does that make sense? 
but uh, but great question. So let's go on. So we've got four, you know, f- four different steps towards towards disclosure of, of uh, the Son, um, and we're into the New Testament. So it's the fully fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man, looking at Christ. Um, fifth is uh, the attestation and narration of prophetic fulfillment of the incarnate Son by gospel writers. So every gospel has got at least one. Matthew's got a bunch of them. So here's Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way. While his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together and found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband-to-be, was a righteous man, because he did not want to disgrace her, <clears throat> he intended to, to divorce her privately. When he contemplated this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because a child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So Matthew adds this. This all happened so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that's the first time in Matthew's gospel where he does that. There's several other times where he says, this all happened so that this would be fulfilled. Um, So Matthew is affirming who Christ is as he's pointing back to fulfillment of prophecy. Um, Mark chapter 1 begins right away with it. So Mark Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, As is written in the prophet Isaiah, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, going back to Old Testament prophecy. Luke 24, uh, 44, so this is Jesus walking down the road to Emmaus. Um, These are my words, uh, he said to them, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you. Oh no, these are to his apostles, right? Disciples, sorry. These are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's an opening for the reader to go, okay, I want to go study those. I want to go read those. I want to go, as I'm, or as I'm reading the Old Testament in my Bible reading, when I get, when I'm getting the Old Testament, I want to, want to pay particular attention when I encounter one of those. Um, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture and said to them, thus it stands written, that, and then he goes through all the things that he's, he, he's accomplished. Uh, You're witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you what my father promised, but stay in the city till being clothed with power from on high. So that's going to happen in, uh, as we read about in the book of Acts. But uh, here's Christ um, pointing them back to the Old Testament um, and as they begin to think about what they've read or learned, um, they're going to know now how to read those scriptures or to, to be able to build those into the testimony of who he is as they become his witnesses. John 20, at the end, we look, we've looked at John 1, but I'm going to go back to John 20 again, uh, because John's very clear about um, why he's written everything. Uh, so he's giving attestation to his narration. Now Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you may have life in his name. Um, John's just telling everything I've written is true. Uh, Everything I've written points to this that you should know. Finally, you've got confirmation and confession throughout the apostolic teachings So everything that follows in the New Testament, after you get past the Gospels and you get past Jesus' ascension that they watch in Acts chapter 1, gives a lot of testimony, a lot of confirmation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, uh, to their teaching and writing. Acts 2.14, you've got Peter's sermon at Pentecost, and Peter clearly tells them who Christ is. Philippians 2 um, as Paul's addressing uh, uh, 
the, uh, the uh, striving for unity um, and, uh, uh, and um, loving and serving others. We talked about the theology lunch today. Then he goes through and gives a testimony of, of what Jesus has done. Um, Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard the quality of God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. He gives a, he gives a, a, a statement, a, a testimony about um, God the Son taking on human flesh, Jesus Christ. And then at the end, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So lots of places you can go in Scripture to get this affirmation and testimony, God the Son took on human flesh in the incarnate virgin birth and I've only given you a few places to look but so what happens next? okay so uh, you've got the scriptures and now you've got the beginning of of um, post apostles, you got the beginning of the church carefully studying the scripture, reading the scripture, teaching the scripture, preaching the scripture, um, uh, um, having new believers come and making sure they understand who Christ is. Um, and then you have other teachings. So they've got to not only steward the church, what they learned from the apostles. And what they are learning from the scriptures as they go, as they study them, um, but you have this responsibility that they see for being able to um, maintain that teaching, that the truth of that teaching, uh, from that point forward. Here's Irenaeus. He's he's a second century, so around this is around 180. He does two things. He writes a an extensive work against the heresies, the Gnostic heresies primarily. And then he also writes something on how to preach through the entire Bible. It's called Demonstration of the Apostolic Teachings. And he begins with creation and he goes all the way through um, to point to um, a Trinitarian faith and also to refute what the Gnostics are saying about who God is and who Christ is. And in that work, he says this, by the invocation of the name of Jesus Christ, crucified under Pontius Pilate, there's a separation and division among mankind, those who believe and those who don't. Whosoever any of these will believe on him shall invoke and call upon him and do his will. He is near and present, fulfilling the request of those who with pure hearts call on him. Now, Irenaeus is... Um, his, uh, his calling at this time is to do two things. One, he wants to, he wants to faithfully have the gospel proclaimed and, and disciple believers. Two, he wants to refute anything that, that's not Christian, and particularly people that are saying things about God and about Christ that's not true. And so when he gets, when he finishes his work, when he finishes his walking through in this demonstration, walking through the story of the entire Bible, right? And there's some interesting interpretations of, of things that you'd see in there, because he's, he does work in the Old Testament to see things that uh, that shadow the coming of Christ. And there's a couple of them that are kind of you kind of go, okay, now do would we agree with that one? So again. Give him credit because he's working these things true through. But he says, this beloved is the preaching of the truth, and this is the manner of our redemption, and this is the way of life which the prophets proclaimed. He's gone through Old Testament, and Christ established. He's gone through Gospels, and the apostles delivered. He's gone through, gone through the apostles uh, sharing the Gospel, refuting, refuting, uh, uh, anything that disagrees with it, uh, planting churches, developing churches, and the church in all the world hands on to her children. So next generation, next generation. 
Um, this we must keep with all certainty, with a sound will and pleasing to God, with good works and a right-willed disposition. So that's his, he's writing this to a friend of his um, so that he'll have a good understanding of this, but he's expecting this to go to others as well. He's expecting this is the pattern that we need to follow. Um, so imagine just thinking about when you're reading your Bible, okay, I've got one main goal. I want to, I want to faithfully understand God's plan leading to the coming of Christ and the gospel and the, the, the mission and mes message that the church has to in, be entrusted with. Imagine if you're reading like that. That's what he was doing. Um, and that's what he was calling others to do. And, it, and he says at one point in his other work against the heresies, he says, if you go to any church, any true church, you'll hear them pro proclaiming the same thing that we are. He's got that expectation that this is gonna happen in every true church in the empire because he's dealing with heresies. Here is the way in which, at least in this period, this was the way of navigating the truth, navigating the way to, to, um, to hold to the essential truths of the faith. Scriptures, reading with a pure mind through the Holy Spirit. So there's many of these early writers that'll talk about the pure mind. They'll say, if you have the pure mind, you'll, you'll understand these things. You'll see these things in the scriptures. Um, the regular fide or rule of faith, and that's the transmission of the teaching that the apostles gave. So Irenaeus, for example, can say, I learned from Polycarp. Polycarp learned from John the Apostle. So he can say that what I'm teaching is just a step away from John. This is what the apostles transmitted. This is how they, told, they taught us how to read the scriptures. This is what they, they declared to be the truths um, from the scriptures. And so part of what the at least this stage of the church is doing is trying to follow and apply a handed down teaching and interpretation. And then unity, uh, working collegially. So when trouble came, either in the camp or outside the camp, hey, let's work together to address this. I think I shared that theology, not the work of one scholar. So there was, uh, at least in periods of the church, a lot of, a lot of work together to try and discern errors, point out things that they could say, no, this is really not true. Even though they're using scripture, that's not right. That's false. And then, uh, and then address the danger of that. Hey, if you follow this, guess what? This is, this is unhealthy for you um, to go and follow that false teacher. Um, and so we're gonna go through three sets of false teachings about Christ. Kind of three periods of early, early church, and some of them are still present today, but we're going to look, look at these. Let's see, how are we doing on time? 725. Yeah, I'm not going to make it, but we'll go a little further. Um, anybody have any questions right now at this point? Okay. How about the little one back there? Any questions from the... Yeah. Kind of was very verbal a little while ago. I thought that was some disagreement with some things I was saying, maybe. So it's, you know. All right, so major false teachings. We'll go through, we'll go through this set, um, and then we'll stop and come back, finish it out next week. I, I don't want to rush through this, this part. So major false teachings, uh, phase one, God or man, and this is about Christ. So we'll look at four different ones. Docetism. So docetism was a form of, Gnosticism, uh, believing that the nature of the physical world was evil, and, it, and they thought it's unthinkable that the divine would become incarnate. So Christ only appeared to have a human body. That's a late first century teaching that happened. Um, what's, what's troubling about that? Yeah, I mean, everything physical that happens, especially his crucifixion, right? Yeah. He couldn't be born, he couldn't 
grow up. He couldn't, couldn't even shed blood would be nothing because of just a fear. Yeah. 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 He couldn't be a real sacrifice. Yeah, he could be a real sacrifice. Yeah. He really would have identified with us and our challenges and temptations mm -hmm. if he was just like a mother, an appearance. Yeah. And I'm thankful to have him as mm -hmm. a great example of not yeah, I mean, you have to have uh, a different idea about how salvation happens. Yeah. Correct? Um, so you have to have a completely different theology of salvation. Um, this one, and the next one we'll see too, this one, the idea is there's only a spiritual salvation. There's not a, there's not a, a human salvation. Yeah. It also makes walking on the water not that impressive. But if you're convicted that um, the world is an evil place, matter bad, spirit good, if you're convicted about that, if you're convicted it, it was even formed by a, 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 uh, a creator who is inferior to the real God, um, then this is going to make sense to you. And you'll, um, you'll dismiss things in Scripture or say, well, those are unfounded things that the things didn't happen that way in order, in order to be able to anchor yourself to, to this belief. One that's like it, Mar Mar Marcionism. Uh, so Marcion was a, he was a champion of Gnosticism in the um, late second century uh, to early third century. Um, he's, he was one of Irenaeus' targets. Um, so the God of the Old Testament, flawed creator, lawgiver, judge, you read the Old Testament and that's what you see, different than the God of the New Testament, who's the true God. Um, he's loving, gracious, spiritual, sent his son as a savior, but not as an incarnate savior. Yeah, so, so very, very similar, denying, denying the flesh of Christ. Um, both of these two views did that. Here are the Ebionites. So Ebionism uh, had a, uh, an investment of, of care for those in need. Um, and they did not believe that um, the Son of God became incarnate. Rather, they saw Jesus as a normal man born of Mary and Joseph. Um, yeah, he was a sacrifice. If he was a normal man born of Mary and Joseph and was making all these proclamations about who he is, I am, the Son of God, and this person, he's a sacrifice. Or you just interpret those, you interpret those statements differently. Um, because they can't be true about who he is. Are there any geographical distinctions in the middle of the series you're talking about? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, this one was closer to right. Jerusalem. Oh, the Ebionites, sorry. <laughs> yeah. This one, closer to, closer to Jerusalem. Um, actually, yeah. Um, possibly not the full New Testament. Okay. Yeah. There's even some early apologists that didn't have the full New Testament. Yeah. But they had, um, they had access to g gospel accounts. Yeah. Direct descendants of the you know, people who came after them directly. Yeah. I mean the yeah. Second century is not that far. You're in the yeah. So uh so second century, so this is you know, like one hundred to Yeah. So you've got a spread 
continuing of Christianity, um, you've got the beginning of transmission of New Testament writings happening, um, more accessible to those who are um, better off in life. <laughs> um, but you have, you have the, you know the, so so they're not they're not denying Jesus, right? They're 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 making a they're making claims and statements about who he is. So they've got familiarity. They've got access to some um, information about him, whether it's they've got the gospels or, um, but this is their conclusion from from uh, what they believe is true that God could not become incarnate. Um, adoptionism, another uh, second century uh, heresy, false teaching. Jesus was a mere man upon whom the divine Christ or spirit descended at baptism or at some point. In fact, there was even one um, advocate of that who believed that uh, Jesus just progressively became more divine in his, in his, uh, through his, through how he lived. Um, Is that still a common belief or not mainstream Christianity, but some current modern day cults? Well, I use the word cult loosely, but isn't it? Isn't that kind of, well, I think Mormon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when they die, they die. But I thought they felt that Christ, somebody believes that Christ on the cross became God, but he was just a man before that. Because I had someone in one of my BSF groups. Yeah. But I don't remember what they were. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. It wasn't mainstream, but yeah. Yeah. But baptism, resurrection, different points, and there's even one strain of it that uh, believed that um, didn't remain divine, didn't remain divine, didn't keep that, but, but, but will return, but will return back physically. Um, so, and of course that's, um, in that view, it's humanly, yeah, you know, he's he was divine for the purpose of what he accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's some early ones, right? And the church is uh, working to address all these, especially especially uh, Gnosticism, those first two, uh, Marcionism and uh, Docetism. Here's what Irenaeus says in this demonstration. So he's he builds this demonstration with the foundation of the Trinity. Um, the first point being God the Father, second God the Son, third God the Spirit. And he says this to clearly establish um, the, uh, uh, the nature of Christ. The Word of God, the Son of God, Christ is our Lord, who is manifested in, to the prophets according to the form of their prophesying and according to the method of di dispensation of the Father. So that's who he's been walking through in his writing, or he will walk through in his writing. Who also at the end of the times to complete and gather up all things was made man among men, visible and tangible, in order to abolish death and show forth life and produce a community of union between God and man. So a pretty early confession um, that he's writing, trying to clarify uh, the, um, the nature of of uh, the Son of God incarnate in this and tying it to Old Testament scriptures, prophecies, tying it to this is the time when the Father intended in the plan of God for that to happen, um, tying the, the uh, salvation aspects and the soteriological aspects, um, tying the intention for the, the chasm between God and man to be bridged by Christ, all those things. Um, 
And so what you're having happen through this, uh, through these, through the period of these teachings that the church is having to address, is a more clearer understanding and expression and teaching about the Trinity, about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, and a lot of focus on what do the scriptures say through this period. Okay. We're uh, not quite halfway through, but we're going to pause for tonight. And because uh, it's time. And we'll pick this up next week. Yeah. Well, we're going to hit. So the, we've seen the early ones. We're going to see the more serious ones in phase two. Um, and then we're going to see the, in, in the third one, we'll see those who wrestle with truly God and truly man. Those two natures in the person of Jesus Christ. So. I'm going to ask one of my early seminary questions. Why do we need to know heresies? Mm -hmm. Joseph Tilbury. Right? Well, I was talking to talking to a, a guy actually from the theology lunch today. He said uh, that uh, um, you know he regularly runs into uh, Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. and knows how to navigate a conversation with them about the. Uh, about Jesus because he understands what they believe and says typical conversation. You have to really, you have to really, you know, push to get direct about things because they'll talk for a long time about. It. So you have to, and so he's, he understands their belief about Jesus. That Jesus is not, uh, not a deity the same as God. Um, and in fact, they'll, the way they interpret uh, John's gospel, we've been looking at that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The, a God. Yeah. Yeah. And they. But you really throw them off when you ask them, well, then is there more than one God? <laughs> but that's where you. That, that goes back to what we talked about earlier about the translation of, of the language. In English is really important because that was the word that was that one word. Yeah. Yeah, I had a Jehovah's Witness uh, one time that came around. Well, there was a couple of them, and uh, they brought you know the regular Green Bible, and they started quoting uh, first uh, John. Mm -hmm. John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, yeah. It's kind of on topic, but maybe just like a little bit off topic. It's okay. So when people say, like, oh, I read your Bible like a paradigm, or your Bible, like how you read the Bible, so you're going to get different interpretations, or how you use the Bible, or how you see the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. The gospel, we still agree on the gospel, or right. you know, they'll kind of say it that way. Yeah. But is that a way to like, like that? To me, that seems like an easy way to get heresies, you know, and, or just like you can pick the bunch you like because yeah. that's how you interpret it. Yeah, like this is how I, you know, because I'm thinking these not all these people who come up with these heresies are like just terrible. You know, they really just read it. Maybe they read it that way. And so um, I guess is that like looking at the Bible now and people talking to you, I mean, do you think there are, so this is why it's kind of off topic, but do you think there are, like, yeah. read the Bible and just be like, well, this is kind of my way of reading it. This is kind of my way of reading it. I mean, is that, can you say that? Or? 
there are things that we can kind of disagree on, but there are things that we should certainly break fellowship over. There are some things that if you, if you think God was, and Jesus was not the Son of God, then we're, we should not be in fellowship. With God. Yeah. Well, um, how to read the Bible is a really important thing to develop and cultivate, um, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, the, and it's true for the entire scriptures, but especially when we're, when we're talking about the things that are, that are essential to the faith, um, those things we got to say, no, no, you, you, if you're reading the Bible and coming up with that, then we, we need to have a conversation about how you're reading the Bible. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to talk about, next week we're going to talk about uh, Athanasius. And one thing Athanasius did was um, when he's battling against the one heresy is he wrote a whole, he, he, he took every scripture that they were trying to use to defend their case and explained how they were interpreting it incorrectly um, and how their presupposition was what drove them to interpret the scriptures that way. Um, so it, um, I would like to think that we're, we're um, Christians all want, to, all want to pursue the same goal in reading the scriptures, right? To be clear about what we believe, to be clear about how to know that for both discipling and for evangelism. So, um, I wouldn't prefer saying, well, I've come up with different conclusions, and so you know, I just read the Bible differently. Well, let's, let's have a conversation about those conclusions um, and how you're getting there. Maybe we should have a class of apologetics. <laughs> Not my specialty, but... And they're a little more ignorant. They just heard something, and so I appreciate now when they say something like, "Oh, they don't get that fully God, fully man," or they don't have this understanding. So I tend yeah. to the conversations I have, I tend to ask more questions. Okay, well, if you believe that he really wasn't God, then how do you explain the healings, or how do you explain the claims? And just ask the questions. So, and if it's, a, if it's morals and ways of life, I don't even know <coughs> that I can't uh, wiggle three minutes once. I just start asking questions because that's where they're making excuses. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad that the yeah. theologians who can have the argument. Yeah. Well, remember that. His mom has, he hasn't come over, he, has, he doesn't try to do that, but his mom has come over to yeah. her white Cadillac one time and, you know, tried to have a conversation. And, so. But we got to love my neighbor, bro. Yeah. Well, I was asking questions. We live across the street from a very um, popular Muslim. She's absolutely delightful, and she'll celebrate holidays, and I go and I ask questions, and she has questions about Christianity, and we we don't agree to disagree, but it's a safe space to think. Evangelism occurs in the relationship first. Yeah. Yeah, right off. yeah particularly. And you, you build a relationship, and as you're building a relationship, then there becomes a dialogue in which you can uh, address Christ. Or, or not address Christ. Interject. Right. Interject. Right. Interject. Right. Are there 
there's still pretty written debate for stuff like it's somebody creating a creed against prosperity gospel. Most life will be difficult from that. Most churches have a yeah. Most churches have a statement of faith, um, and so that's that's their. Is that getting written into modern day churches? What's that? Nineties. Uh, Mid nineties, I think. Yeah. Nashville Yeah. But a lot of a lot of churches I don't know the percentage, I'm saying a lot, it just because I go and look at um, websites, especially when I have students, I'll go look at okay, you know, um, tell me your church. Go look at your statement of faith for what we're going to be talking about in this class, but I'll go look too. And uh, some of them are not there, which is kind of surprising. I, I would hope that you'd have a state, your statement of beliefs on your website so people could read them. Um, but some of them are real skimpy. I mean, it's more of a purpose statement than it is a statement of faith. Um, I was preaching at a church down in South of Indiana, a very small church, and uh, their statement of faith was very profound, and it's a very old one. Mm -hmm. Eighteen thirty-five, New Hampshire Baptist statement of faith. Was that what it was? It, it, it had to have been <laughs> something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is. Um, it's one thing to have a, a, a creed or a statement of faith. It's another thing to to help your people understand what what you believe and teach through it so and we're doing a little bit of that here i think so all right come back next week let me pray for you real quick father thank you for this evening thank you for uh for this class thank you for your goodness to us thank you lord for your your word your holy word passed down through the centuries to us. Uh, thank you for your son. Um, and uh, or as we continue to think about him, um, Father, may our worship deepen, may our confession strengthen, uh, may our awareness of those around us and what they think uh, become uh, clearer so that we can faithfully proclaim who he is. Um, so I just pray that that would continue in the lives of the people here. In Christ's name, amen.